If the idea of increasing your muscle size by 90% seems too good to be true, Dr. Andrew Huberman is here to show you that it's possible. Tune in and listen closely as he shares his valuable knowledge and expertise on muscle hypertrophy. Take this chance to learn, grow, and discover the strength you never knew you had. A couple of key variables that I'll spell out for you, and if you do that, you can greatly increase muscle hypertrophy, muscle size, and or muscle strength, 80 to 90%, and you don't necessarily have to use heavy weights in order to do that. Weight training, unlike a lot of other forms of exercise, has a unique aspect to it, which is this feature that I guess some people call it the pump, which is the fact that blood goes into the muscle when you train. It's the only kind of training where you actually get a window into what the result might actually look like before you actually accomplish that result. Most people, when they hear the word muscle, they just think about strength. But of course, muscles are involved in everything that we do. They are involved in speaking. They are involved in sitting and standing up. They are involved in lifting objects, including ourselves. They are absolutely essential for maintaining how we breathe. They are absolutely essential for ambulation, for moving, and for skills of any kind. So when we think about muscle, we don't just want to think about muscle, the meat that is muscle, but what controls that muscle. And no surprise, what controls muscle is the nervous system. We have upper motor neurons in our motor cortex. So those are in our, in our skull and those are involved in deliberate movement. So if I decide that I'm going to pick my pen and up and put it down, which is what I'm doing right now, my upper motor neurons were involved in generating that movement. Those upper motor neurons send signals down to my spinal cord where there are two categories of neurons. One are the lower motor neurons and those lower motor neurons send little wires that we call axons out to our muscles and cause those muscles to contract. They do that by dumping chemicals onto the muscle. Anytime we're walking or doing something where we don't have to think about it to do it deliberately, it's just happening reflexively, that central pattern generators and motor neurons. Anytime we're doing something deliberately, that the top-down control, as we call it, from the upper motor neurons comes in and takes control of that system. Muscle is metabolically expensive. And indeed, compared to other tissues, compared to fat, compared to bone, compared to almost all other tissues except brain tissue, muscle is the most metabolically demanding, which is why people who have more muscle relative to adipose tissue to fat, they can eat more and they're more of a furnace. They just kind of burn that up. If you've ever carried a box while moving or you were carrying heavy groceries to the car or you were exercising particularly hard and you felt the burn, well, that burning, so when you feel that burn, that is not lactic acid. That is lactate that's present to suppress the burn, to suppress acidity. It's also a fuel. When you feel that burn, lactate is shuttled to those areas of the muscle and there's an actual fuel burning process where in the absence of oxygen, you can continue to generate muscular contractions. Here's a reason that regardless of what kind of exercise you do, if it's weight training or running or cycling or swimming, that every once in a while, about 10% of the time, you should exercise to the point of intensity where you start to feel that so-called burn. What I'm telling you is that if you feel a burn from a particular exercise or movement, that burn is going to be buffered by this molecule we call lactate. Lactate will then provide additional fuel for additional work. That burn is a, acts as a beacon to the lactate, which comes in and allows you to do more work. It's not a signal to stop. The reason for that is that lactate shows up to the site of the burn and it acts as a hormonal signal for other organs of the body in a very positive way. Everything about muscle hypertrophy, about stimulating muscle growth, is about generating isolated contractions, about challenging specific muscles in a very unnatural way. Whereas with strength, it's about using musculature as a system, moving weights, moving resistance, moving the body. The specific goal of hypertrophy is to isolate specific nerve to muscle pathways so that you stimulate the chemical and signaling transduction events in muscles so that those muscles respond by getting larger. Three major stimuli for changing the way that muscle works and making muscles stronger, larger, or better in some way. And those are stress, tension, and damage. 
you have what's called myosin. And just think of myosin as it's kind of like a wire. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a bunch of beads and wires that extend across the muscle. The way muscles get bigger is that basically the myosin gets thicker. It's a protein, right? And it gets thicker. Imagine that you're holding a bouquet of balloons, a bunch of balloons by their strings. Imagine that one of the balloons the, is very close to your hand, another one is a little bit higher up, and so this bouquet is very disorganized. In other words, the string extending out of your hand, the strings rather extending out of your hand, are all different lengths. And so the balloons are all over the place. That's essentially what myosin looks like in the muscle. And those strings are what we call the filaments. And then the myosin head the, the, is the balloon. When you stress a muscle properly, or you give it sufficient tension, or you damage the muscle just enough, there's an adaptive response that takes place where protein is synthesized, and it's a very specific protein, it's myosin. The myosin gets thicker. In other words, the balloons get bigger. The way it happens is the nerve, the neuron has to tell the muscle to get stronger. What it does, it releases certain chemicals that within the muscle, there are certain chemicals released rather that make those balloons, as I'm referring to them, the myosin get thicker. Many people who are afraid of like getting too bulky, for instance, are afraid of lifting weights. But I think the research shows now that everyone of pretty much every age should be doing some sort of resistance exercise, even if that's body weight exercises in order to offset this age-related decline in muscle contractile ability, muscle strength, et cetera, improve bone density. There's nothing good about getting frail and weak over time. If you can isolate that, what they call the brain or mind muscle connection, and you can contract the muscle to the point where it cramps a little bit, that you hold a decent to high potential to change the strength and the size of that muscle if you train it properly. Now, if you have a hard time doing that, chances are you won't be able to do that. If, for instance, you focus on your your uh, back muscle, like we all have these muscles called the, the lat, moving your elbow back behind your body. If you can do that mentally, or you can do that physical movement of moving your elbow back behind your body and you can contract that muscle hard, chances are that you have the capacity to enhance the strength and or size of that particular muscle because you have the neural control of that muscle. For individuals that are untrained, meaning they have been doing resistance exercise for anywhere from zero, probably out to about two years. They're sort of untrained. For those people, the key parameter seems to be to perform enough sets of a given exercise per muscle per week. The same is also true for people that have been training for one or two years or more. What differs is how many sets to perform depending on whether or not you're trained or untrained. The range of sets to do in order to improve strength, to activate these cascades in the muscle, ranges anywhere from two, believe it or not, to 20 per week. It appears that five sets per week in this 30% to 80% of the one repetition maximum range, getting close to failure or occasionally actually going to failure, full muscular failure. About five sets per week is what's required just to maintain your muscles. That's just to maintain. And then there's this huge range that goes all the way up to 15 and in some case, 20 sets per week. Now, how many sets you perform is going to depend on the intensity of the work that you perform. Most of your training, most of your sets should be not to failure. And the reason for that is it allows you to do more volume of work without fatiguing the nervous system and depleting the nerve to muscle connection in ways that are detrimental. Perform anywhere from five to 15 sets of resistance exercise per week, and that's per muscle, and that's in this 30 to 80% of what your one repetition maximum. That seems to be the, the most scientifically supported way of offsetting any decline in muscle strength, if you're working in the kind of five set range, and in increasing muscle strength when you start to get up into the 10 and 15 set range. If you can generate a high intensity contraction using these upper motor neuron to motor, lower motor neuron pathways to muscle, it will take fewer sets in order to stimulate the muscle to maintain itself 
and to stimulate the muscle in order to grow or get stronger. So the more efficient you are in recruiting motor units, the more you will recruit these so-called high threshold motor units, the ones that are hard to get to, the more you will kick off the cascades of things within muscle that stimulate muscle growth and strength. Resistance workouts of any kind tend to be best favored by workouts that are somewhere between 45 minutes and 60 minutes and generally not longer than 60 minutes because that's when all the uh, things like cortisol and some of the inflammatory pathways really start to uh, create a situation in the muscle and in the body that's not so great for you. If the session extends too long past 75 minutes and is of sufficiently high intensity, chances are testosterone levels will start to drop and cortisol levels will go up in ways that can be detrimental to recovery and the goals of the training. But that's different than training that's specifically geared toward increasing testosterone. Duncan French, who's one of the directors of the UFC Performance Center at University of Connecticut Stores, did some beautiful work. He and his colleagues found the ideal training protocols for stimulating testosterone release, which is something that many people want to do for a variety of reasons. And that involved doing six sets of 10 repetitions, even if it requires lightening the weight on one set to the next with about two minutes, 120 seconds rest in between sets, which if you think about it is pretty short rest and is pretty darn hard work. Now, what's interesting is that there's a very limited threshold for increasing testosterone. That protocol of six sets of 10 repetitions led to these big increases in serum testosterone. But if people did 10 sets of 10, so just four more repetitions per set, then testosterone did not increase. It does appear that learning to move weights as fast as you safely can, especially under moderate to heavy loads, can increase explosiveness and speed. And most of that effect is from changes in the neurons. It's not from changes in the muscle, it's from changes in the way that the upper motor neurons communicate with the lower motor neurons. For people that want to get stronger, it appears that the slowing down of the weight as things get harder is a key parameter in recruiting those high threshold motor units. Let's say you have incredible abilities to isolate just your quadriceps, for instance, and you do a workout where you isolate your quadriceps, you do your six sets of intense work, or maybe use Palmer cooling and you're able to do 12 sets of intense work and you're done. And that muscle group, the next day is certainly not going to be recovered. You're really trying to assess whether or not you can generate the same amount of force. If you start seeing a 10% or 20% certainly reduction in that, that's concerning. It means that your system, that your nervous system as a whole, it's not necessarily fatigued, is that the pathways from nerve to muscle are still in the process of rewiring themselves in order to generate force. Soreness itself is not required for improvements in strength, improvements in explosiveness, improvements in hypertrophy. That's a myth. Now, if you do experience delayed onset muscle soreness, chances are you stressed that particular muscle pretty well. The first thing that's absolutely key for nerve to muscle communication and physical performance of any kind might not sound that exciting to you, but it is very exciting, and that's salt. Nerves, nerve cells, neurons, communicate with each other and communicate with muscle by electricity. But that electricity is generated by particular ions moving into and out of the neuron. And the rushing in of a particular ion, sodium, salt, is what allows nerve cells to fire. If you don't have enough salt in your system, your neurons and your brain and your nerve to muscle communication will be terrible. So you wanna make sure that you have enough salt, potassium and magnesium in your system if you wanna perform well. I realize that salt isn't a very glamorous uh, performance tool, but it is vital. It is absolutely vital. There are also tools that one can use to reduce inflammation at a kind of foundational level away from training. The kind of golden three, according to Andy Galpin, and the ones that he recommends are sufficient omega-3s, in general getting above 1,000 milligrams of EPA per day to keep inflammation uh, low or relatively low, vitamin D, and in some cases, magnesium malate. 
The omega-3, vitamin D, and magnesium malinate, uh, malate excuse me, trio seem to be an effective way to reduce inflammation at kind of a systemic level. But remember, you want inflammation provided you're not damaging the muscle so much that you're injured during the training session because that's the stimulus for change in those muscles. The other thing that's been shown over and over again in numerous well-controlled studies to improve muscle performance is creatine. Creatine is a fuel source at, for early, early in bouts of activity, for high intensity activity. It is also a fuel source for neurons in the brain, and it can have some cognitive enhancing effects. 18 studies supporting that muscle creatine content can be increased by ingesting creatine. How much creatine? For somebody who's about 180 pounds, five grams a day should be sufficient or so. Heavier than 180, so if you get like, if you're a 220 pound or 230 pound person, 10 to 15 grams of creatine, it was thought that you had to load it in higher dosages for a few days and then maintain it at um, lower dosages. So you take, you know, 20 or 30 grams a day, then back off to five or 10. It doesn't seem to be the case that you can get all the benefits from taking the dosages at the low level. There are 66 studies, 66, showing that power output is greatly increased anywhere from 12 to 20 percent. And this is sprinting and running and jumping as well as weightlifting by creatine. The ability to um, hydrate your body is improved by creatine because of the way that it brings more uh, water into cells of various kinds. As an indirect effect, it can help in increase lean mass because of the way that it brings more water into muscle and probably also because of the way that if you get stronger, you can generate more force and generate more hypertrophy. Any discussion about muscle and muscle performance would not be adequate if we didn't mention something about nutrition. Ingesting 700 to 3,000 milligrams of the essential amino acid leucine with each meal is important. Now, that does not necessarily mean from supplements. In fact, most people recommend that you get your protein, you get your amino acids, including your essential amino acids and your leucine from whole foods. High quality proteins are high density proteins. What do you mean by that? Well, it is true that a lot of sources of protein are found in things like beans and nuts and things like that, that all the essential amino acids can be found there. But per unit calorie, if it's in your practice, if it, and it's in your ethics to ingest animal proteins, it's true that, for instance, 200 uh, calories of steak or chicken or fish or eggs will have a higher density of essential amino acids than the equivalent amount of calories from nuts or plants. Eating two to four times a day, making sure you're getting sufficient uh, amino acids in a way that's compatible with your ethics and with your nutritional regimen is going to support um, muscle repair, muscle growth, strength improvements, 